Hey everyone, what is up? Welcome to the Crushing Classical Podcast, redefining a thriving classical music career. On the show today, I have Colin Jacobson, violinist and founder of the string quartet Brooklyn Rider. This quartet plays traditional string music as well as large variety of new music. This season, they will release an album called So Many Things on Naive Records, including music by Colin Jacobson, Caroline Shaw, John Adams, Nico Mooley, Bjork, Sting, Kate Bush, and Elvis Costello, among others. The quartet just celebrated its 10th anniversary last season. Colin also plays with Silk Road Ensemble, as well as The Knights, an orchestra he founded with his brother Eric. I'm excited to get started on this interview and find out all about this amazing stuff. Welcome, Colin. How are you? Thanks so much. Great to be here. Thanks. Here as in the virtual world of here. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'd love to hear about how you got started in this most unusual of career paths. Most people don't play in, in mostly ensembles that they created themselves. So can you, can you start by just telling us the background of your career and how you started that? Sure. I mean, I would go back to being a kid, actually, um, in a musical household. My dad played violin in the Metropolitan Opera for over 30 years, and uh, my mom was a flutist. And then my brother, who you mentioned, who I started the nights with, and actually also Brooklyn Ryder, um, is four years younger. And since we had flute, violin, and violin in the house, I think they felt like um, we needed some bass and also... Um, you know, just not to have the competitive thing of us playing the same instrument, blah, blah. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, obviously there's, there's the, the community aspect that I observed very early on to music, which was that though my dad's day job in a sense was the Metropolitan Opera, not a bad one, um, I think right. that I, my love of music took fire uh, when I saw him with his friends in our living room playing chamber music and just doing it because they loved it and having a good time and making mistakes and laughing about those mistakes and all of that kind of thing. So it felt like a natural thing when my brother and I were old enough to continue that um, in our living room with friends, um, you know, and I was recently, this is basically when I was recently out of Juilliard or maybe I was still there and he was in high school and then continuing when I was out of school and he was at Juilliard with our friends intermingling and actually some of my dad's friends as well. So it was cross-generational. And wow. in, in a certain sense, you know, there's all the schooling, there are all the great teachers I feel like I've had and mentors. But um, if you get right down to why I play music, it's that living room situation. Um, and I think that, um, you know, so Brooklyn Rider uh, in, in large part grew out of that feeling and the nights as well. And I think with the nights, we wanted to take that intimate sens uh, sensitivity of, of a living room and see if that couldn't be transferred in some way to an orchestral experience. I mean, it's not exactly transferable, but I think that that has been a, dri a driving motivation there as well. Cool. I love that you're, I love that you, um, wanted to bring that chamber music feel to an orchestra, you know, and then you had the, the guts to say, we're starting our own orchestra. I mean, not very many people do that. Right. Um, well, you know, I, I think that when I came out of school, um, it was an interesting time, maybe continues to be in that certain older structures were breaking down whether or changing, whether that be the recording world um, or just the fact that um, I, I had heard from my father, for instance, for years, basically when he was growing up, either you were a soloist or you got an orchestra job and chamber music was pretty much something, once again, you did in your living room for fun, but wasn't really a viable career path for all but a couple of quartets, I think, mm -hmm. more or less. And um, I feel like I came out into the world at a time when many of my colleagues and friends at Juilliard um, went out into the world and were creating their own chamber music festivals, series, and um, that seemed like an incredibly bright spot in a world where, actually, when I was in school, there, you know, there was nothing like the um, cultural entrepreneurship push that seems to have hit most conservatories and music schools around the country. It was really 
you know, you practice hard and you win a job. But on the other hand, while I was there, it felt like there there was a message that, oh, the recording industry is going away, so don't count on that. Um, and you need to be at class a lot. I mean, and, and I would say that I, I was, when I was going to school, I was already out there in the world playing chamber music, playing some concerto dates. And there was always a struggle of, I wanted to be based in school and, um, and learning. But if you miss too many classes, then you were in danger of failing. And that was sort of a mixed um, thing. Whereas now I think like there's more of a push, like, well, how do you make a life in music? And um, so that's interesting in that, uh, in a way, the Knight's very first um, grant we ever received from anyone was when my brother and I went into President Polisi's office and we asked for if he had any advice or help um, that he could offer the Knights, which was this group that we told him we had just started and we were putting on a concert and we were planning to go on retreat for a week and rehearse intensely, cook and you know, live together for a week and see what happened. And uh, he seemed intrigued and he gave us $500 from his discretionary funds, which was great. And then, but he did tell us, you know, you might think about that name a little bit, which at that point was the Knights of the Many Sided Table. And that was a bit of a mouthful and had been something that my brother just came up with um, sort of off the cuff when we had first put on a concert and they just, you know, the series like, well, does the group have a name? And it wasn't really in our minds that we were starting a group at that point. We were just putting on a concert, you know. So that's what he kind of whimsically called it. And uh, so then we, we did think about it. We're like, well, yeah, that is an, a little bit of an unwieldy name. And we shortened it to the Knights and even thought about, well, does that represent who we are? And then we were like, yeah, actually, there is a sense of what did Knights stand for? You know, going on a quest, doing it in the companion of like-minded explorers, individuals, and going all the way in the service of whatever that goal is. So for us, obviously, it's the music and sharing that with people. So we thought, well, actually, that does represent who we are. That's awesome. And so I, I have a couple questions about that. So who is President uh, Polisi? Is that who you oh, said he's the outgoing uh, president of the Juilliard School. He's been there for oh. many years and done wonderful work there. Um, yeah, so... Okay. And then you said you were getting ready to go on a retreat together. Or did you just, and you wanted to, was it a, just like a rehearsal retreat or something that you set up with, exactly. with the group? Yeah. Okay. So you went to do like an intensive week with them and, and you included cooking in that. So tell me more about that. Well, I just think uh, once again, having developed bonds of friendship in an, a living room situation um, over chamber music, um, we sort of wanted to uh, go further with those bonds and in a way, you know, having been to summer festivals, which is where some of the best relationships in the music world, I think, do develop like at a Tanglewood kind of place or Aspen or yeah. Ravinia, wherever it is. Um, we know that part of the aspect of that is that you're all living together and experiencing the same thing outside of your maybe daily routine. And so that seemed like a way to take hold of whatever the music we wanted to do and, and go deep into it without the distractions. And so that we did that for a couple of years um, when we were doing just a few projects a year with the, uh, with the Knights. And I think in a way it solidified a, a base of who we are to this, that we, you know, think about to this day. And, and I keep trying to get us to do a retreat like that again. And it's just life is harder. There are more, you know, challenges financially, et cetera. So um, we've only been able to do it in small groups a couple of days here or there. But it still remains a dream to do what, what I call a uh, night's camp, basically, again. <laughs> yeah. Where did you do it? Uh, well, actually, just out in Long Island, uh, found a big house that someone was willing to, you know, let us use and... Um, you know, then Polisi's $500 uh, donation to our cause allowed us to purchase the food for the week, basically, and transportation. That's so great. So um, so that sounds really like because you were spending that amount of time together, that there was a lot of collaboration involved. And I know you've mentioned collaboration to me before with your groups. And so what what happens on those weekends? You know, I'm, I'm sure you rehearse specific 
music, but is there discussion? Is there ideas where you, you're coming up with new things to do with the group? Like what, what kinds of things do you do at Knights Camp? Because this is such a foreign concept to me. I mean, not really because of the music um, festival point that you made, but for a regular orchestra, um, you know, you would just meet up and have rehearsals on a week. So, so how, how does, how does this doing this make, uh, how does it affect the product and, and just the process? Right. Well, I think, um, in those days, honestly, those retreats really were about, um, in intense rehearsal, uh, intensive in a way that, um, you can't do most of the time as an orchestra, I think, cause it's just, um, you know, when you're just, we were this, and this, mind you, this was about a 17 person string group that we're talking about in around 2000, 2001 for those projects. So a little bit smaller. And, um, but we'd literally, you know, we, we, we were all sleeping in the same house. We, we would get up, someone make breakfast or several people and then rehearse from whatever, 10 to one and, and, uh, you know, be able to go, as deep into an idea as someone wanted. And it was a collaborative situation. So ideas are flying from both principal positions, but from uh, all over the group. And just figuring out that dynamic um, was part of those early days. And, you know, just in a certain sense, um, having not unlimited time, because actually, whatever the amount of time you schedule to rehearse for something, I find that it never feels like enough, but, yeah. um, but, you know, in a certain sense without traveling and all that, we had time to explore. And, uh, and then of course, in a way, conversations over dinner or whatever arose organically. There wasn't like, oh, are we going to become an orchestra at this point? I think it was more like this, it was a per project mentality. Um, mm -hmm. so let's just go all the way into whatever we're doing this week. And, see how that goes. And, you know, over time, we had done that a few times, and it felt like there was a good energy, both from um, the people within the group, but also those who then we presented that music to, to go forward. And um, so I, I'm roundabout answering your question. At some point, Eric and I decided, let's also try doing this kind of rehearsal and this kind of intense experience with a larger group with a Beethoven sized symphony, because we had an opportunity at a now defunct Beethoven festival that happened um, a little outside of New York um, at that in, in around 2005 or so. And, and that similarly took us to a new place and it could invite all of our wind plane friends into the discussion. And, um, but I think in terms of goals for Knights Camp at this point, the way we've done it in still not my fully realized vision for that, but um, what it has been is two to three days of um, going back in a way at this point to just reading music for fun, discovering, you know, a chance to do listening sessions together and discuss, well, what is it about that recording that drives you crazy? It's so beautiful. Or... Um, what is this piece that I want to share with the group that I haven't heard before or actually getting outside of um, things like getting, we got a, a Baroque dancer, a uh, dance teacher to come and teach us how you actually dance the minuet, you know, and, uh, and then try and, and both being the people accompanying the dance class and the dancers in it and rotating in and out. So to find that physical connection to what I find often is, um, in a way, the simplest notes on the page in a Haydn symphony, for instance, but maybe the hardest stylistically to feel good about collectively. So that was an yeah. attempt to um, figure that out. And just kind of almost, um, you know, not, not exactly trust falls, but sort of group activities that are fun to do that, <laughs> that um, you know, solidify those bonds and, and, and also just time for programming discussion or, um, how are, you know, check-ins with how we are as a group, that, that kind of thing is, is what Knights Camp represents to me at this point. I love it. It's so educational too, to take your time, um, to meet with somebody about actually what the dance is supposed to feel like. I, that seems like something they should do in school, you know, just to really connect to right. the music. Well, I think, yeah, that connection is like, and physical connection is something that, um, 
I feel like is something I learned a lot in Silk Road Ensemble as well, just especially with the opportunity to, uh, when I first jumped into that group, um, not knowing Persian music, for instance, I was placed in a group with this amazing composer and musician, Kehan Kalhor. And, you know, there are notes on a page and, uh, you know, a lot of that particular piece had a, a kind of hypnotic constant groove, but one that I was not familiar with playing very much. And in order to convey that groove, he had written accents on certain notes in a steady 16th note pattern, for instance. And, you know, you, you could correctly, uh, what's the word, um, just realize that what you see on the page. And then you can realize, well, but... I'm doing what's on the page, but actually that sounds nothing like what he's doing. Um, the accents are in the right place, but the feel is totally wrong. So then I was like, oh, let's be, I'm going to be a monkey right now. I'm going to do exactly what he does by watching and listening exclusively right. and forget the notes on the page. And then I felt like much closer to what was going on there. And that was just a very quick uh, lesson that, uh, as Western musicians, mainly dealing with text, um, you know, we're, we are taught in school somehow that we should um, get, you know, get ourselves out of the page. But I think somehow with the volume of music people play and whatever, that often there is, it's hard to get off of the page. And I think particularly in an orchestral experience, it's hard to get to that place of feel rather than execution. And so that has been a goal of mine with all my groups that we get to a shared physicality of the music rather than the brain telling the body what to do. So you can get to a place of uh, internalization, I guess. And when you see folk musicians who've just learned by ear or, um, you know, I don't know, various people who, when you see, they seem very natural doing what they do. I think that's when the music really speaks to an audience. I think if there's a barrier in terms of physicality, it often falls flat. I agree. And, you know, it's making me think of um, a video that I saw of yours from the Vail International Dance Festival. I saw it on your Facebook page and I, I watched it five times. That guy dancing with your group was so incredible it was sort of like a michael jackson ish yeah. kind of vibe uh -huh. and his dancing was so great and you the way you guys were really into the piece it sounded like a hard piece but you were moving with the piece and feeling the grooves and and that dancer knew every single like snare drum tap that was going to happen and he had a choreographed move too it was so awesome how did you how did you get that collaboration um well let's see i guess that uh, is the result of several several collaborations. Uh, I mean, or pro a project developing that took further flight, which is um, Brooklyn Riders' sort of tenth anniversary project uh, was to. It was called the Brooklyn Rider Almanac. So, if I back up for a second, um, Brooklyn Rider, the name for that group came from. Well, first of all, a year-long search for a name because it's impossible to get a name that everyone feels <laughs> represents who you are. And But uh, it, it comes from the Blue Rider Group, which was an artistic collective active about 1910 with the likes of Schoenberg, the composer, Kandinsky, the painter, Franz Marc, the painter, others. And Kandinsky was sort of the, um, was the one spearheading it. And he published the Blue Rider Almanac and... Um, you know, in a way, their emblem, their their branding logo, if you if you can call it that, which you wouldn't at that time, but uh, yeah. was a blue horse. And I think that it was a sense of let's get out of um, traditional academic realism and what are the ways you can do that. And they found a very eclectic way towards abstraction, I think. And Kandinsky yeah. was pointing that way in his painting and Schoenberg in his music. But we just liked their sense of... Um, omnivorous appetite, I guess, and, uh, and willingness to c collaborate across disciplines. So, but we didn't want to specialize in Schoenberg's music or, you know, music of that time. So, and we all live in Brooklyn, so we became Brooklyn writer. Um, so for our 10th anniversary, we thought, let's do something and, you know, call it the Brooklyn writer almanac. And, uh, similarly looking across borders, ask mostly people not in the classical world, 
to write short pieces, sort of song length, which would be the form probably most of these people are familiar with, um, and ask them to specifically name an artistic source of inspiration of the last 50 years, which is the time period that sort of saw the rise of modern popular culture. Um, and we asked people from the jazz world, the indie rock world, uh, you know, the folk world to write pieces, some of whom had never written a specifically just string quartet piece, though I think pretty much all of them had experience doing at least arranging work with strings. Um, and the piece that you're talking about was by the jazz pianist and composer VJ Iyer. And what's cool is actually the guy playing the drums on the video you mentioned in Vale is Greg Sonier, who's an um, amazing drummer and uh, the drummer of the band Deerhoof. And he also wrote a, a piece for uh, the Almanac project. Um, wow. So you just contacted... Us. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you sorry. just con you contacted all these people and, and just asked them to write a string quartet, like Elvis Costello and all, all the people that were listed for the... For the Oh, no, that's a different album. I'm sorry. That is, a, that is our most recent album that Elvis is on. So actually, there is some um, overlap in the sense of some of the composers on our most recent al album also are not from the classical world. But there also are people like John Adams and Nico Mooley, Carolyn okay. Shaw, who are part of the mainstream sort of contemporary classical world. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so part of our idea there was let's... Uh, so by asking these composers to name a source of inspiration, it's full. It's it's getting a window into their process, and um, and in a way, it opened up windows. So, for instance, V.J. Iyer's piece, he named James Brown as his source of inspiration for the piece he wrote, and uh, particularly there was like a video that he saw on YouTube of James Brown in the early days. Um, basically, everyone was sitting down, but there was so much. Um, uh, sort of extracurricular body movement and, and tapping with feet and snapping and whatever that it, that it almost seemed like they were human drum sets to him. And so he sort of was channeling that idea in the very tricky, interesting grooves that he wrote for his piece um, yeah. for Brooklyn Rider. And of course, then we, uh, Vale is a place that we've played at the dance festival curated by Damien Witzel for a number of years and they've been supportive and they, we suggested that we have all these pieces that think could lend themselves to dance well. And he got into it. And, um, so he, so he helped, um, work with, uh, Lil Buck, who is an amazing, um, exponent of juke in sort of Memphis street dance, which does in, in a sense, remind me of Michael Jackson, as you mentioned, in that he, he seems weightless, you know, it seems like he's moonwalking yeah. and in a way he's like a ballet dancer on point, but he's using sneakers and, and, yeah. and he's also very loose limbed. Like it seems all double jointed and crazy to me. Like there's, it's a yeah. human pretzel himself. <laughs> it was so neat. And yeah, I just loved watching it. He really did seem weightless and, um, I, I bet it was hard not to watch him while you were playing, but obviously it was the rhythms were so hard you had to yeah, focus. Unfortunately, on the music. I basically had to just check out the video because we were pretty focused on the task at hand. Yeah, yeah. Which is often yeah. the sad thing about playing with dancers is like uh, <laughs> you can't really watch them while you're playing, except there is this sort of sense that we are in the room doing something together, which is fun. Yeah. So it seems to me like with Brooklyn Rider and the Knights, but especially what you're describing right now with Brooklyn Rider, is um, by collaborating with all these different people, you're really um, broadening the possibilities for your audience. I'd like to think so. I mean, I feel like we like to surprise ourselves and um, and believe that if it's something we're passionate about, there's a chance that that fire would light up in someone else and um, love when, when that does happen. And, um, I think it means, uh, always looking for an interesting new collaborations, pieces to play. Uh, but it also, I mean, both Brooklyn Rider and the Knights are still based in classical tradition. I mean, the 300 year, whatever tradition of string quartet playing and, mm -hmm. and orchestral music and trying to find our own way with those things. And I think part of, um, both groups, in some ways, uh, programming identity is well. How do these? 
how do these elements relate to each other? How does the past inform the present, you know, and vice versa, which is not a new idea. Of course, people have been doing that for since people have been around, but um, it just manifests in, you know, the way that those groups see those things. Right. Yeah. It's so, so did you ever, did you ever um, think of yourself as possibly being an orchestral musician, just the traditional route? Or did you ever audition or think of it, of doing that for yourself? I didn't. I think more I was on the track of I would like to be a soloist playing concerti with orchestras and, you know, uh -huh. did quite a fair amount of that as a, as a kid, you know, um, got to play the Brooks Scottish fantasy with the New York Phil when I was 14. So that, that uh -huh. was cool. Uh, you know, but I also, um, I think at some point I had my teacher, Robert Mann was great and, um, almost more for his pearls of wisdom that that would happen and um, more than a violinistic approach just a world approach and he said you know when I was getting close to graduating well whatever you do don't be a lemming and follow all the other violinists doing the same path you know do something that's your own and he didn't specify what that was but at the time it was I, I thought well maybe I've grown up in New York my dad is based in New York I have this you know, base of people that I play chamber music with all the time, but I should go somewhere where I know no one and play for people who see music in a different way. And so I did go to Amsterdam for a year to study. Actually, I, I went to, I, I sort of took a year where I played for a different, uh, a bunch of different teachers in Europe and found this lady, Vera Betts, in Amsterdam. And she's someone who herself plays a lot of new music, but also a lot of classical music, but on gut strings. And uh, her husband is the great Baroque cellist, Honor Bilsma, and they made a lot of incredible, uh, unusual recordings of classical chamber music together. Um, and she just offered a very different viewpoint on music. And, and uh, it, it kind of, that was 2000, 2001. It was right when Silk Road was starting. And many of the things she was talking about in some strange way were connecting with what I was seeing for instance, even on a technical level, Kehan Kalhor, the Persian musician I mentioned, doing with his bow and um, just the fantasy and imagination that were present there. And I, I wanted to um, grab that. And, and the other good thing about when I was in Amsterdam is I, I, uh, I just had lessons. I didn't have classes. I played orchestra projects. It was like a certificate program. But I had time to go to a lot of shows. And Amsterdam is a place of a, it's a small city, so there isn't too much going on any one night, but it's a credible variety, you know, world music, new music, the Concertgebouw, you know, um, the Asko Schoenberg ensemble doing new music and um, everything in between. So I, I just felt it was a, it was a study period that was, that was good. And I also learned loneliness, which is a good thing as a musician. <laughs> <laughs> so you did it all by yourself you didn't go with a friend or your brother or anything no yeah is that around the time that you started playing with silk road or was yeah. that way before that? summer of oh, 2000 was, was uh, the first workshop so uh i just had experienced that and then i started studying in amsterdam and so there was a lot of time to spend digesting what i had just experienced and listening and going further with things so it was a good time and um, at that point, I, w I hadn't been writing music since high school, but I, I started getting this itch. I remember thinking in Amsterdam, I need to do something with what I've seen and heard, and ideas started percolating. And eventually, it was going to Iran to visit Kehan in, um, let's see, I think it was around 2004. Uh, and it was just a, it wasn't a concert experience. It was a cultural exchange so that I could basically go further with Persian music and culture and learn more um, about this man that I'd been touring with in Silk Road, you know, with Yo-Yo and everyone for a number of years. And after I got back from that, um, it did feel like I got to do something. So the first thing I did was, was um, write and arrange this song, Ascending Bird, for Brooklyn Rider that we recorded then. Um, back, I don't know, it was about 10 years ago. And since then, we've played that tune with, with Silk Road in a number of versions. I did the version for string orchestra that the YouTube symphony played. And then most recently, we just recorded 
the full orchestra version with the Knights um, for an album that's going to come out in a few months, um, along with uh, Osvaldo Goliath's cello concerto Azul with Yoya. So I'm I'm really psyched oh about gosh. that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, your your career is so it seems so intentional to me. Like you always knew what you wanted, and I so I always ask my guests about their defining moment, which I lovingly called the fuck this moment <laughs> which is where you have you're on your career path and you have a crossroads to choose between where you're doing the safe route or you go to an unknown area and you know I, i'm just curious if you ever had that kind of a moment or if you always just knew what you wanted so i'm just i just have to ask it um no, I mean, I would say that that was one fuck you moment was going to Amsterdam and studying with, um, you know, someone who played quite differently from anyone I knew. And, and it was, and also Silk Road. And, and so in a way, those two things, in a way, I took a, a left turn, you know, not in Albuquerque, but in Tehran, perhaps, <laughs> <I don't laughs> know. just because Kahan was a very big influence on me at that stage. Just uh -huh. I, I somehow felt like it was this window into another means of expression within music from another culture, but somehow it shed light on where I was coming from as well and opened a door into how I might create music and write music. So um, in a way, at that point, I stopped feeling like I need to um, figure out how to get an agent so that I can book concertos with X and Y orchestra and I need to look at music solely through this lens of how does it bring people together? Um, how can I find new means of expression within it? And um, how can I go uh, deeper? And, and in a way, it was, it, it was around the same time also that the Knights were having those early experiences and all the people in Brooklyn Rider played in Silk Road and... Um, the nights as well. So it was a very close knit world. And um, I think in a way, Brooklyn Rider then started once I was able and the other members of Brooklyn Rider were able to do the thing that is hard for anyone, but maybe particularly guys, I don't know, <laughs> but um, commitment, you know, saying like, I commit to these three other people that we're going to be a group, we're going to call ourselves this, and we're going to go deep into quartet, which I think is one of the more difficult things to do on a consistent basis. I mean, plenty of, you know, movies and articles about how a quartet is like a marriage, but it is. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. And we wouldn't have taken that step if uh, we often talk about like, you know, you don't want to commit unless you're 90% there in terms of brain synchronicity with <laughs> other people in a small group. But then that yeah. last 10% of um, bringing things to really uh, the level you want them to, to speak to people is where the hard work happens. Right. Well, I love that. It's so interesting because you, you've been talking about all these great projects and, and then, but still had that sort of nagging feeling that you needed to get, um, you know, get with the right, what did you say, the managers or whoever need, who, whoever the representation was going to be to get you um, solo work and you, and, you, and you decided, no, I need to broaden my horizons and you pushed yourself even further. So that's certainly unknown. I mean, going, going to a place where you're, where you're researching Iranian culture and music that's, and, and feeling that kind of cultural music is, is totally opposite and totally unsafe in my, you know, not, I mean, maybe a little bit unsafe, actually unsafe to go visit Iran, but um, also just so unknown because right. that, that kind of, that kind of music is, is not how you were, you know, it was not how, it was, how I grew up expressing music. No, it was, it's a different, right. different language, but then you start to see, well, what are the things that overlap and what are those right. values? And, um, and, and, and that becomes an, its own interesting thing. I mean, I think like, uh, you know, often when we go into schools and either with Brooklyn Rider Nights or Silk Road, and there's so much talk of what is a life in music, um, there's a, a feeling that, 
when I was in school that like, oh, if you just win this competition and then get that manager, then concerts will appear. And I think we just decided amongst the people that I was working with, and we all influenced each other, Johnny Gandelsman, the other violinist in Brooklyn, writer, Nick Cords, and my brother, Eric, and plenty of other people that instead of waiting around for that to happen, we just wanted to put on concerts and invite our friends. And in a way, that's where Brooklyn Rider and the Knights' early concerts really took flight was, um, you know, booking a venue in New York and renting it if necessary or just asking them to present us, usually not with any sort of real fee attached, um, and then inviting an audience, you know, and, and often in those days making it into a party afterwards as well. And I think that the... the the feeling of those as social as well as musical events um, just were, A, really fun, but also felt like there was a joy in knowing all sides of what goes into putting on a concert. And so you know, empathy so building for all the work that orchestras do around the country and presenters do uh, so that you don't just show up and play, but you know that <laughs> everything that's gone into that is pretty serious. And a lot of people have put a lot of work into it and you're grateful, you know? Yeah. And then on top of it, you had to find the people to come to the concerts, which is usually not a problem when you're just going and showing up and playing an orchestra gig, you know, right. you, that's not part of your job to find the people sitting in the seats. So right. you did, you did it all. And, you know, you mentioned the element of waiting. So it's funny because I'm, I'm listening to you thinking about how different it is for a musician like me who just, um, you know, I wanted an orchestra job because the solo thing, you know, there's not that many horn player solos, soloists. And right. I just wasn't, Except that wasn't what I was going to Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, violin is a common. Sure. Dime a, um, dozen. <laughs> dime a dozen. Yeah, you could just do that. No big deal. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying there's way more violin sure. soloists there than there are horn player or any other instrument for that matter. Um, and so but there's still that element of waiting all the time. Like you were you're either waiting for someone to pick you up and wait for those concerts to come in. Same with um the waiting for other people where you're just, you're waiting for that right audition. You're waiting for yeah. your big break. You're waiting for that time where you're actually going to nail the audition and the audition committee likes what they're hearing and they're in a good mood and you're in a good mood and yeah. all this stuff has to line up and it you're just like, you know, line up. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so a lot of waiting takes a lot of time and you know, and I love that you're just saying, you know, just, we did it. We just didn't want to do all that waiting and we, we lined it up and it takes, it takes courage to say, we're doing this. I'm pulling the trigger. I'm, I'm booking a place. And also I think all concerts should be parties. Let's be clear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, totally. Let's make it a party afterwards. Why not? Yeah. So that's awesome. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what proved to be the case uh, with both Brooklyn Rider and the Knights, they are, for was that when we did um, then sort of have a good buzz around some of those concerts that we were putting on, we were able to invite an agent to it and they could see firsthand what we were doing. And that speaks way louder than if you just email someone or, or someone just talking about you or whatever. But I think, you know, music really does come down to the live experience and I would like to believe that even with all the me new media and um, virtual reality whatever maybe that'll come in but and you can put it on your wall and whatever but still it's being yeah. with other people in a live space where anything is possible is yeah. what makes the music experience great and maybe will save us <laughs> maybe yeah and I think I think having the having conversations like you went out and you invited people to your concerts and asked them to invite their friends and and made it into an actual face-to-face -face social interaction and you know situation where you're you're going out and get you have to make this happen because you've planned it and yeah I think you're right when with all the social media and everything it, it it becomes like a thing well I'll just you know I'll advertise for it on my page I'll I'll send out a tweet or whatever and um, I think what really creates a movement or 
or an, or action is just actually talking to people about it. And you probably did a whole lot of that. Yeah, definitely had more time to do it in those days too. But um, but yes, there's no substitute for FaceTime and for the you know people hearing what you do if you're passionate about it. I think. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, I have fi two final questions for you. Yeah. Um, what is the one habit or behavior you've developed that has made the most difference in your career so far? I think, uh, you know, that movie, uh, Yes, Ma'am, <laughs> um, the uh, Jim Carrey movie, I think it was. I think I yeah. said, I think even when I felt like scared and would want to say no, I, I would say yes. And being a sponge, like, uh, just trying to soak it in. And I think it comes in handy, for instance, as a musician, when you are faced with a new score in a language you don't understand, and you may therefore have insecurities about it. However, uh, I think that often results in an unfortunate composer-performer relationship where the performer tries to show the composer what they did wrong instead of, well, let's, you know, let's go look at this as the uh, architect engineer relationship. And let's try to realize this plan as best as we can without judgment at first. And then of course, yeah. making suggestions along the way, um, as an example of, um, you know, sponge mentality. So I think sponge, I think it's never a bad time to be open to new ideas and you can chew them about and then spit them out if you if you don't like them but if you don't let them in in the beginning then it's hard to grow i guess i like that architecture and um engineer working together kind of idea because it, uh, i think oftentimes as musicians we get a new piece of music and we're immediately like no this doesn't work for my instrument or right. this you know it's Instead like a of, knee -jerk how can we work relationship together? almost. It's like, oh, I know this isn't going to work. Well, let's let's give it a chance. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So, and that helped you broaden your horizons for all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. And probably when when rock musicians or indie guys <clears throat> write for you, you know, that's probably a lot of back and forth. I assume that that you'd have to do so that they, you know, if they're not used to writing for strings. Yeah, though I will say with that project with the Almanac that I was surprised with how complete the scores were for most of the pieces and how little we actually changed them. And I think that was um, a result of maybe they, they had fear like, oh, we've got to really do this. And, and, and I think they really got into it. Um, I mean, there were surprises along the way, like the drummer I mentioned, Greg Sonier, um, I, I think of, you know, that a drummer would probably write a very groove oriented piece with interesting rhythms, but he, he, his piece was more of a conceptual thing with a lot of silence. And basically we were moving together in, in rhythm, but with very interesting chordal writing, you know, so that was, that was a nice surprise. Um, but, uh, but yes, I think like we do like to work with composers and, have there be uh, a back and forth. I mean, definitely when we, we collaborated with Bela Fleck, um, you know, he brought sketches that we would try out and he would ask for advice on, uh, you know, what we thought and what were other options. And then we would try stuff out and he would try out lots of different things on us. So I think um, that is an interesting part of the process. And of course, you know, we look at the active communication between for instance, Brahms and Joachim on the violin concerto or Beethoven and Clement. And, you know, uh, there's, there's, I think that, that was a, a part of our tradition that composers and performers weren't so separate as they became perhaps in the late 20th century. And maybe that mirrors society in general becoming more specialized. But if I think of, you know, Yo-Yo as a big influence on all three of my groups and many of the people involved. And I think he's really a synthesis. Is that a word? Uh, someone who synthesizes and looks at the world that way. How do you bring these seemingly disparate things together? And I've taken that as a source of uh, inspiration and ways of 
programming ways of writing music myself and just thinking about this thing that we do. Well, that might have answered my next question, which is who in the classical world inspires you? But Well, um, yeah, that would be my go-to for sure, because my life has changed from that encounter with Yo-Yo and uh, just seeing the way, you know, I I think of, um, for instance, within Silk Road, working with people like the great tabla player Sandeep Das, um, who comes from a culture where, as a classical musician, it's still the guru system, meaning you go and live with your master teacher in their house, and you're an apprentice very much. You sweep their floor as well as learn music from them, and uh, it's a hardcore thing. Um, But uh, I think you not only learn to play music from them, but you also often travel with them maybe even carry their luggage on the road, (laughs) but uh, you observe how they interact with the world, with other musicians, with presenters. And I feel like I got a crash course in the real world and how to deal with it from Yo-Yo, from the Silk Road tours. But then, of course, from playing pieces like Ravel Trio or Shostakovich Trio in the early Silk Road concerts 40, 50 times and seeing how he deals with different concert halls and the communication with audience and... um, and then just, you know, he's always pushing himself and those around him to think of uh, new ways to deal with the world, basically. And if anything, I'm overwhelmed by how big he thinks. And I sometimes think I, I would prefer I, my modus operandi, at least when you're writing music, you can't. It's hard for me to start with the biggest possible thing and go to the smallest. Often it's a kernel of something that grows into something big in that creative process. But I think there are different ways of thinking, and that's just how he operates. Yeah, you know, I, I got that when I was looking at the Silk Road website. I was like, who who takes on the entire world at once? That's what he did with his ensemble. You know, he said, like, I'm going to con- connect world cultures. I mean, that's it's huge. It's yeah. huge. It's really inspiring, super inspiring. I think you're maybe the third person that I've interviewed who said (laughs) Yo-Yo (laughs) Ma out of like six or seven. I don't know how many. Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising at all. He's, he's incredible. It's so, it's so inspiring to hear you tell me what it's like to work with him too. Yeah. Well, it's uh, been a journey. And as I said, I'm really uh, excited about this new album that's going to come out. Um, It's going to be like the end of, March, right before the Knights is at the Kennedy Center as part of the Shift Festival, which I think isn't North Carolina Symphony yes. going to be there as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's cool. Uh, and um, uh, so the, and the new album is, is Azul, Osvaldo Goliath's cello concerto for Yo-Yo, but which has a sort of theme of looking up at the stars uh, from below, from the, you know, where we live, and then having the perspective of seeing the earth from above. And in particular, I think he was in Israel when in 2000, there was the renewed wave of violence between Palestinians and Israelis and trying to reconcile those images in his mind with a trip to the planetarium around the same time and seeing earth from above and and these beautiful images. So we sort of took that as the point of departure for the whole album, um, and, you know, if there's a moment to sort of, I mean, never, it's always a good time. And actually, we've only had those images available for the last 50 years or so since we started going to space. But, you know, if there's a moment to look at the planet as one and consider how something that happens in one part of the planet affects another, it might be now. So it feels timely somehow to look at that through music. I love how you make these connections with your music and the world and the people around you. Um, so that the album is coming out in March? Late March, I believe. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I want to make sure I hear that when it comes out. Definitely. Yeah. Some good horn moments on there. <laughs> really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to hear it. Yeah. Well, Colin, thank you so much for coming on the show today and, and having this interview. It's been really great. Thanks so much, Tracy. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. If you're enjoying Crushing Classical, please write a review on iTunes. And be sure to connect with me on Facebook at facebook.com slash crushingclassical and on Instagram at crushingclassical and on Twitter at crushclassical.
So I'll see you there. Thank you. Bye.